Welcome to Gearbox Talk, a show all about gear. I'm your host, Brad Luttrell. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Go Wild, which is where I met today's guest, Jonathan Metcalf. This dude is an absolute beast when it comes to locating and hunting public land elk. He's also refined a process for scouting that is super efficient, and it has to be with his lifestyle. But th- this keeps his hunting compact amid a busy schedule, and it's also, as Jonathan's going to point out, his system is really affordable. He notes several times that he, he tries to find gear and, and he puts that gear to the test as a as a curation of the everyman budget. And he likes to find gear that anybody can buy with any budget. And I really do like that about the guy. Today, we're going to talk about Jonathan's choice for mapping when it comes to both scouting and infield navigation. We're going to talk about his tried and true elk calling brands, his tips for finding a call that fits you well. We're going to talk about his packs and his favorite sidearm for the backcountry. If you see something you're interested in, the products are in the show notes on YouTube or on the podcast. And if you're watching on Go Wild, we're listing the gear out there too. And if you love this this gear talk, please stop for a second and make sure you subscribe. That way you're catching all the weekly content that we release from Go Wild and Gearbox Talk. Elk season is almost here and I am super pumped about this show and I'm really excited to get Jonathan's tips on how to chat, uh, chat with these screaming monsters of the woods and how to do it efficiently, effectively, and on a budget. This is Gearbox Talk with Jonathan Metcalf. Jonathan Metcalf, welcome to Gearbox Talk, a show all about gear. I'm excited to hear about the gear you're using in the field. Welcome aboard, bud. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. You and I have been friends for several years now, and I've been following your story along, and I know you have a tried and true process for getting into the backcountry and getting into the backcountry efficiently. So tell people a little bit about, we're going to talk about your gear. We're going to talk about uh, how Jonathan's scouting, his GPS, some of his tried and true elk calls his pack of choice and his sidearm today we'll get into all those questions in a second but i want him to just give a little intro to himself and his hunting background yeah my name is uh jonathan metcalf and i'm from western oregon um i'm a elk hunter i hunt other stuff deer and bear and other things but really my passion is in chasing elk um I would say public land primarily, um, but I'm also a father and I work. I'm a blue collar guy. I do the construction thing. So I'm working 60, 90 hours a week. So being efficient on the weekend is my best option. With, with that kind of uh, passion and also time limit, you got to have your uh, scouting process really down. Walk us through your approach to scouting and, and how you're really finding these areas. I know you hit a lot of the same areas year to year, but each, you know, it, still there's scouting involved. Um, whether, whether it's doing online with mapping. And then also we'll talk a little bit about the GPS choice of, uh, once you're getting out or, uh, or what you're using to navigate once you're out in the field, but let's start with the scouting question. How do you approach public land scouting for elk? So everybody's always said for years, you do what everybody else doesn't do. Like that's the secret, but what is that? And that's where I got to challenge you being the end user or the person that's just in, in the pursuit is you have to define that for yourself. Is that go further or is that hunt closer to the road? Is that cover more ground or is that slow down and cover a smaller area? I mean, that's, you have to answer that for yourself because that's going to change even within your state place to place, or even in the same unit, it could be range to range that changes. So you have to recognize that. So what I'm doing for scouting is my scouting primarily starts in the winter. Um, I like to do that last week of December to March is really the golden time. And, and the reason being on that, Brad, is that's when all the vegetation dies. That's when the woods reveals its true self. So you get to see trails and, and wallows or rubs or whatever that are uncovered because the vegetation's dead. So you get to see a lot more of the story, if you will. Um, and so that's, that's what I personally do for scouting is I start in December and I draw, so I dive in and I just drop pinpoints. Uh, to answer your GPS question, I don't, I use the GPS on my phone. I run two programs. So I've been playing with um, the new base map hunt fish. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm 
kind of starting to dive into that. There's a lot of things I like about that, but I, I've been an Onyx user for several years now. And so Onyx is what I use. And what I'll do is every time I'm in the woods scouting or hiking or whatever, if I find something of interest, I just drop a pin and then I can come back to it and look at it later on and kind of turn it to a topo and figure out, just try to piece the puzzle together, if you will. Nice, nice. So you're labeling those pins as you go, and you can kind of refer back to them. Um, are you, I think on line, with Onyx, you can do it actually from a computer even too, right? Yes. Yeah, so, and same with that base map one. They transfer from your phone to your computer back and forth, and they show. So, yeah, you can dive into it. Um, I just got a laptop again uh, a couple months ago. So, really, I've always just done it off my phone. I'll drop a pin. I'll put a color to it just to give me like a search more or – this type of animal or whatever, this was this. And then I'd start looking at that. I'm a big fan of topographical because I think the, the top of stuff tells you a lot, you know, water and elevation and bench, different stuff. And so I'll start to dive in on topo and try to piece together like why, because I'm a data guy, um, but like, why would they be there? Why is that located where it's at? And that's what's really helped me find success lately. What are one or two things on the, the, you know, whether it's topo map or, or, you know, things you're scouting for, just give a couple of tips for the new, uh, new, you mentioned game trails. Obviously that's a big one where they're traveling through, but what other things are you looking for when you're scouting? Yeah. So, um, rubs, um, I would say if you find bedding areas, that's good to know that they're there. I would drop pins on that, but rubs tell a story, you know, whether that bull was stripping off velvet there or that deer was rubbing velvet or if he was mad and raking that up or if he's marking his territory. I mean, the every little bit of thing of data that you can piece together will help you understand why that animal is where it is at that time of year. Now for being an elk hunter, when I'm looking at a rub, I'm an archery guy, but that's where I want to be that time of year. I want to understand why that elk at that time of year is doing that. And so I place myself in a position off sign that I can kind of picture and put together. If you like back up on the map, I can see a pattern of like, okay, here's the spider web of places that this is happening. And I can take that and move it to a new area and emulate, maybe and get lucky, guess, guess how, you know, and find similarities and there, that becomes a behavioral pattern. Yeah, that's not unlike how I do whitetail. I'm not an elk hunter. We have elk in Kentucky, but I, I've kind of told you in the past, like it's kind of tough to get an elk yeah. draw in Kentucky without a landowner. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm doing the same thing on whitetail, you know, looking for where they're bedding versus where they're, you know, coming out into the field, looking for game trails. You, you use all that to kind of formulate a, a understanding of where that animal's traveling and then try to find where they're most likely to be. For whitetail, it's a little bit different than how you guys chase them with bulls. You guys get to run around in the woods and go uh, be madmen and, and your, your savages chasing after them. I've kind of got to pick my anchor point most of the time, at least for the day. You can move a little bit, but we don't move around quite as much. All right, so GPS and scouting solutions are Onyx and base map. Let's talk about the big debate, and this is the big debate in anything, right? Whether whether it's elk and turkey or deer, it's all about the call, right? It's it's about uh, sounding realistic. It's about the quality of the sound. It's about even uh, longevity of the calls, right? Like like there's a lot of things that the call has to stand up to. You've tried a lot of them. Uh, what are your tried and true uh, elk calls that you're using for the season? Okay, so for me personally. Um I'd like to just note that it's different for everybody. Everybody's got to find that your mouth, your palate is different. So, I mean, honestly, I recommend you play with as many different calls as you can preseason and find the ones that are comfortable, find the ones that you can be the most consistent with. But the biggest thing is you just want to practice. So the company that I've done a lot of work with in the past and that I just, their reads don't wear out on me and I get a really, really strong and consistent Tone with his Phelps game calls. And I'm going to spin my camera around here for you. So that being said, this is them. Okay, this is their reed pouch. And as you can see, we're getting ready to roll into hunting season. So this thing right here, it's got all sorts of different colors, different types. And these are all the ones that have made the cut just in case. Now, uh, on these reeds, here, let's see if I pull one out. Like this one is a Phelps. Uh, this is the Bro edition, right? So it's black. It's got a yellow latex. It's different. Um, I run reeds and then I run the bugle tube. Uh, this is a unleashed bugle tube. It's just a lime green version of it. Um, 
And then this is a mountain ambush cover on it because the old school military, I thought, looked kind of cool. So that's what I do for that. Backing up really quick, Brad, um, on the GPS thing, and this will just take half a second. Yeah. I carry these rugged maps. You can use them as a rain shelter. They're that type of material. Okay, this is just another way. I always carry one of these in my pack in the unit I'm in. If my phone dies, if it gets, well, it shouldn't get wet and break, but you know how it is in the woods. If something yep. happens, I like to have a hard copy just in case you get into a situation that you can find your way out of it. So these are what I've been covering. Um, like I said, these fit down. You can bend them. You could use them as a floor mat. You rinse them off. These are pretty cool. And this nice. guy is uh, pretty affordable too. So, yeah, that's what I use for calls, though, is these Phelps. What, are there any other brands for, for think of the rookie for for calls? Are there any other brands that's uh, you know I know you've worked with Phelps, but you kind you kind of hit it on the head that it's you know you got to find that um, I, I know this from turkey hunting you know you got to find that one that really works for you. Any other ones come to mind that people could check out to see see what works? I know Phelps is a big one. A lot of people use the Phelps calls and they're high quality, but anything else come to mind? No, dude. Yeah, there's tons. So um, Rocky Mountain hunting calls rocky jacobson he makes um, some really good call a lot of people really like him uh, you know his son Corey jacobson mm -hmm. he's pretty popular he makes some stuff uh i actually have some stuff from one of my buddies is helps testers on their staff and he's sending me some that he wants me to give him another go so i'm gonna even even i am trying other stuff i'm gonna see how they do and how comfortable it can be in my palate uh, native by carlton makes stuff also uh, there's there's tons of choices. It's just honestly, it's just find a good fit for you. I will tell you, and this is uh, where I got to be careful. I guess is there's a lot of these calls that are being used by people all over, and they can only make so many sounds or types mm -hmm. of noise. So I would I would ask people that when you're doing this stuff, learn to mimic elk and not people, because if you shoot for the same tones, although not uh, not no two people sound identical, you sound so close that these elk are picking up, in my opinion, on tonal qualities and just behavioral, and people are overcalling these days. One thing I will actually be doing less of this year is calling, except for very specifically looking for something. But I'm also after a certain age class of animals. So I haven't used the elk hunting app again because I I haven't elk hunted. But the uh, the same guys make it. It's the Elk Nut app. I can't remember that dude's actual name. He goes oh. by the Elk Nut. What's his name? Yeah, yeah, Paul Medell. Yeah, yeah. Paul's uh, partnered up with my buddy Taylor, and they have a really good app where, where Paul teaches you how to call. And, and uh, I, again, haven't used it, but I can speak to the quality of the turkey calling app, which Scott Ellis uses and teaches you. And I imagine the elk app is similar, but, but the, the turkey calling app has Scott doing the call, but it also has a real bird sound, which is cool. So you can hear it and you can compare um, if, if the elk calls done that, uh, the elk app has done that way. I would check that out too, but definitely check out the elk nut app, uh, uh, for, for some context to Jonathan's advice there to be able to hear what the actual animal sounds like instead of mimic. It's kind of like copying a Xerox, right? You, you're co making a copy of a copy. I get what you're saying there. All right, ma'am. Um, very important for elk hunting season is the pack. You know, you, you have so much gear you have to, to move around anyways, especially if you're in it for a longer trip. I know a lot of your trips are, uh, two or three days more condensed with your work schedule and whatnot, but uh, you still are a guy who not only has worked with pack companies, you've spent a lot of time thinking about your process and thinking about the pack. So what is your pack of choice uh, for, for elk hunting season in, in, come the fall? So for me personally, I like to run with a day pack style without getting into a specific name right out of the gate. I like to run that 2000 to 4,000 cubic inch space. It gives me I'm not a weight guy. I don't, I mean, look at me, I'm made of weight, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm not worried about being six pounds too heavy or whatever. So I personally, I like that two to 4,000 cubic inch range. That way I can carry an extra rain jacket, a couple extra pairs of socks, food, water, like, but at the same time, I'm not trying to pack, like I'm going to be out there for nine days and I want to be room. I want to be kind of be able to keep my pack tight to me and you know, so that's where that kind of fluctuates. If it's 100 degrees in September, my rain jacket might not make it. But if it's, you know, getting to the end of September and it's 40 degree mornings and stuff, you know, I might bring in a windbreaker or a puffy or something like that. So for me, I play with multiple packs. You can take a little stroll. I play with multiple packs. Um, I've done work with wilderness pack specialties. Um, so I'm going to answer this question in a two part format for you, Brad. 
Yeah. Because I think that a big thing to, to keep in mind is a lot of people like, what do you want to pay to play? Okay. And then also what do you support? So the, both the packs that I'm running this year are American made. Um, one of them is very compliant and that's this wilderness pack specialties. Uh, I'm going to show you this one. It is a, so this is the axis. It's empty right now. We're getting ready to load for elk season. So this is the axis uh, pack. This is one of their new packs. This is 1800 to 2600 cubic inches. And I'm running it with two medium pockets on the front. So, you know, these are 600 cubic inch pockets or so. Okay. And then this part of it extends out. So that's how you get the 18 to the 2600. Mm -hmm. It can stuff out. And this pack, the bag removes from the frame. This frame that I'm running on this one is the Yukon frame. Okay. It's got a meat shelf. But the reason I'm running, the reason I like this one, this is one of their new bags. And for anybody that wants a good pack, that's comfortable, that's strong and durable, and American made, this is a really great option. It's also super affordable. Um, this, as it sits, is like a $460 combination compared to some of your other brands or seven or eight or 900 but that comes with the buy once cry once i guess depending on it's just a preference <laughs> thing but if you're trying to get into it at a budget i would say check out wilderness packs they got like this is the axis they got a big horn they got a cu several options under that 400 dollar mark that and they're all american-made gear it's cordora it's tough you know so that would be that um through some of my business stuff that i do i'm running this exo also this year and so this is the 4800 on their k3 frame it's the same thing made out of cordura very nice very very well thought out with the zippers and the pockets um this one's a little bit bigger than what i would normally run being a 4800 but like i said i got asked by a friend to give it a shot and see what it was about so i've been running this the last couple months kind of putting it through its paces and seeing how i like it and i'm really enjoying it so far brad uh but i ordered this in the new they just did a cryptic thing and uh i got an actual the 3400 or 3200 i believe i can't remember off the top of my head anyway i got the 3000 cubic inch version of it coming and that's what i'll be elk hunting with this year my brother is running this pack in multi-cam though so this is what we're running we're running exo made in america and then we're running a wilderness packs um also made in america awesome so I see you have your sidearm there uh, uh, on that second pack you were showing. You've already got another nice thing to look for is having that accessible. If you're all, you know, if you're going to have your your bag strapped on and you're moving, you want to have access to that sidearm. I want to call that out as a feature that Jonathan um, had on that second bag. You could see his holster was there. But I also wanted to talk to you, man. You, you know, you're you're running around with. Um, you got bears, wolves, mountain lions, you know, lots of reasons to carry a sidearm when hunting. And no matter what part of the country you're in, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to have a sidearm. So, um, you know, you, you have a military background, you're a gun guy. I'm, I'm always curious to hear what people choose, uh, for, for their side. What, what's your sidearm of choice when elk hunting? Okay. So for me personally, this is, again, I'm going to answer this as honest as I can. And in my opinion, I think that a sidearm is a comfort item. It's a luxury item. If no matter what you have or how big it is, if you aren't proficient with you, it's literally just there as a confidence booster. I want that to be a side note. There, I haven't had to draw my sidearm on an animal yet, thankfully. But in this situation that that happens, if I never shoot my sidearm, whatever caliber, whatever model, whoever makes it, it's not going to be relevant because at that time I'm under pressure, I'm probably not going to make a good judgment call, let alone maybe be able to get it out of the holster fast enough to be efficient. So on that note, when it comes to that, I'm a big fan of, I used to carry a 45. I still do sometimes. And I kind of like, I really like the 10 millimeter round also. It's kind of just a do it all great gun, but affordability for an average guy which is a lot of what i've been testing if you're just a normal dude with a smaller budget i have found the nine millimeter is a more practical 
like less expensive route. And I'm sure some people will disagree, but you can find nine millimeter ammo anywhere. And it's a lot less expensive than 10 millimeter or even 45. So I think it's really important to note when you're getting into the sidearm stuff that you need to be proficient, which takes practice yep. and it takes time, trigger time. So, and you have to, like, don't just read it in an article and say that this is for me because the biggest thing that you're going to get out of having this weapon on your side, or I get out of it anyway, is just a confidence in knowing maybe I'm not alone. You know what I mean? So that being said, sorry guys for the flip. No, you're good. Uh, I do some work with Springfield. I ran this. This is the brand new. Hellcat. Hey, Jonathan, you, you cut so out on me. Is, you cut out on me. Can you start over on that? You said, I, I heard I've done some work for and then, and then it glitched where you flipped. Just go ahead and start yeah, that no answer problem. over. So I've done some work for Springfield Armory. And so what I'm using this year is this is their new Hellcat. Okay. This is the X. This is Springfield Armory's Hellcat. It's a nine millimeter. It's a micro compact. And this particular gun is 13 plus one in the chamber. So, and it comes in, I mean, you guys can see this and for reference, it's yay big on me. I mean, it's literally two by four inches. This thing is tiny, but it still has up to 14 rounds you can carry in a single clip. Now, I like this because it, it's small and it barks, but it, it's rather invisible in my kit. So if I don't want to run it in the holster, which right here I'm running an ivory holster on my pack, okay, just to show you this thing, it goes to nothing. Mm -hmm. Like it's nothing. It don't get caught on branches. It's not big and bulky. It don't weigh hardly nothing. And that's why I run that one. But for the guys that are asking, like, how do you make your selection or whatever, excuse me, I mean, look at this for size on the pack, okay? But if I want to drop my pack and I want to go just my bino harness or whatever, and I have a big bulky pistol, I can't just stuff it in my pocket or whatever. I would need another holster. I'm going to leave it. With this, I can literally stick it back behind my binos or in my side pocket or in my back pocket where my wallet would go. It is that small that I'm able to do that, okay? Um, there's other options like an XDM and xdm elite they're a larger capacity version uh, i mean it's not the same model as the hellcat but it's a nine millimeter with 20 plus one and you know i think the other one is my 45 version of it's 13 also so it, it's really a preference thing but i'm a big fan of springfields because they're tried and true in the field lots and lots of other options sig makes some great weapons um everybody likes glock there's h and k i mean it that is literally just a preference thing. Yeah, man. I it's funny. I um some people would probably give me uh, grief for carrying the baby Glock, but I carry it for all the same reasons you're using the Hellcat. I've heard great things about the Hellcat. Uh, I know it gets great reviews. It, they're in demand right now. They're almost hard to find. But the which a lot, a lot of ammunition and firearms are hard to find right now. But uh, for the same reasons, I I choose to use my, my baby Glock for the same reasons, get, get more rounds. I have, it's, it's compact. Uh, hardly know it's there yet. I know where it is at all times, which I think is important and I'm more comfortable. So I, I just like shooting that gun. And I think that goes really, uh, back to it. I'm, I'm, that is the most accurate pistol that I have. And for me, for me personally, it doesn't mean the other ones aren't even accurate. It's just that I shoot the best with that gun. I feel I have the most confidence with that gun. I know that gun the best. And I do think that comes down to everything when you're hunting. I mean, if you're carrying the big 45 and you're not comfortable shooting it, then it, with under du uh, the duration of stress, do you think you're going to be any more accurate? Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, so what it comes down for, for me when I was testing some of this stuff is uh, Brad, is it really comes down to, I was trying to test stuff that's more affordable to guys that were in a position I was just a year and a half ago. And that's like, what's something I can do that's realistic. And you know, that's kind of a big deal. And when it comes to, if you're going to shoot a bunch throughout the year, or try to get proficient, yeah. maybe a 10 millimeter is not the best option. It right. is a great option. And that's probably my favorite option. But if you're just a normal dude that only got so much time and only has so much money a year, that nine millimeter round is a rather affordable price point and it's the confidence again. I mean, yep. it works. If you shoot some of something in the right spot, it will do its job. Uh, 
maybe not as efficiently or with as big of a hole, but <laughs> Hey, you know what? At least you have something. I mean, I would argue if a bear wants to get a hold of you, it's probably going to get a hold of you, you know, yeah. unfortunately, but yep. at least you can be confident or at least fake confident when you're out there, <laughs> that you have something to stop something. You know? Yeah, dude, dude. Awesome. Awesome rundown on uh, a couple pieces of your, your backcountry hunting for elk season. Uh, where can people find you to, to get in touch if they, uh, you're awesome about a- answering questions. I- I'm serious. If you all have questions, uh, you can, you can drop them in the comments on here for, for future shows. I'm sure we'll have Jonathan back on, but I would love to give you as a resource to people, where can they find you to be able to ask some questions about your setup or some of the gear you're using? Yeah, man. Uh, any kind of questions you have about gear, what I'm using, why I'm using it, affordability, unbiased opinions. There's, there's lots and lots of options. Um, I am found on uh, Instagram at jmat underscore Kong Valley and also at Kong Valley underscore collective. Um, but that's pretty much where you can get the best of hold of me or shoot Brad an email. And if it's somebody that really needs something, he'll get you my email. And I can help you get dialed in. However, Yes, sir. All right, dude, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Gearbox Talk and giving us a little insight. Yeah, bud. I appreciate you having me. All right. Good luck this season, too. You too. Bye. Thank you, Jonathan Metcalf. That was an awesome, awesome chat. I loved some of his in- insights there. And I really like that this guy isn't just trying to buy the most expensive gear. He's trying to find gear that's effective, but also cost efficient. If you enjoyed this episode, I really think you should check out the upcoming Restless Native with him. It's going to be releasing the week after. This episode is releasing around August 19th, I think is the date. Today is Sunday, August 16th, which is why I can't remember when it's releasing. But the following week will be a Restless Native with Jonathan and it's awesome it's a great chat you get to hear a little bit more of his personality than the gearbox talk really allows for you know gear gearbox talk is hyper focused on the expert selection of gear we really get into some of jonathan's background on that upcoming show of restless native so make sure you subscribe to this youtube channel or podcast or wherever you're watching this because that that same restless native will be released on this same channel so you know make sure you subscribe also a reminder that all products mentioned in the show are in the show notes so if something struck your fancy and you, you want to check it out or pick it up typically nine times out of ten go wild's going to get a commission and a cut of that sale so when you make that purchase we get accredited for that which not only helps fund go wild and this show we're actually going to donate a portion of our proceeds back into outdoor nonprofits, which is pretty cool and it may be a good excuse to pick up the gear you want anyways All right. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're dropping in comments. I'd love to hear from people. Uh, If we had questions we didn't get to or things you really wanted me to dive deeper into, let me know. I mean, we're already in, what is this show, 13 or 14 of Gearbox Talk, and we're already getting uh, back around to, you know, we did a backcountry hunting episode, and now we're doing some more backcountry hunting episodes from different experts, and it's different discussion. So if you're leaving feedback that I can can see and think about, I'll bring it up when these these talks come back around. Uh, If you really enjoyed this show with Jonathan, I really recommend you check out my show with the Hoffmans because it's an hour long dive into backcountry hunting and it's, it's super thorough and you get to hear what a professional hunting guide and a professional packer recommend for, for uh, hunting, hunting overall. And they do it in Alaska, but it's a, some, some similar setups as to what Jonathan's doing. Maybe a little bit more permanent of a hunting setup. Uh, it's, it's, it's a more of a longer stay with some of the tents and stuff they're using, but it's cool. It's really cool for comparison. The other thing I recommend you check out is the show with Wes Robinson on everyday carry. I, I was thinking of that show, the whole time Jonathan was talking through his strategy on sidearms. A lot of that is overlapping with Wes's philosophy. And I actually think that Wes takes a really good dive that's applicable to hunting in his EDC. That's it for today for Gearbox Talk. I'm out. (laughs) 